All right, what's up, everybody? Uh, my name is Mark Holmes. As some of you might know, I'm the deacon. Uh, this is Talent XM. Um, today, uh, speaking of talent, I have Luis Hernandez here with me. Uh, what's going on, Luis? Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, Luis uh, is a, a former figure skater uh, internationally, as well as a current entrepreneur and business owner. So um, wanted to bring him on and kind of talk about his journey, what he's doing now, and uh, I guess what kind of led him to where he's at now. Uh, but um, as I mentioned to you before, I don't really like scripts, but given your background, the shining background you have, I mean, some call you the Mayan king. I did have to write. <laughs> I did have to write some things down. I wanted to just read it so I can do it justice, if that's all right with you. Of course. All right, I got to introduce you to the world, man. So, <laughs> as I said before, Luis is a former competitive figure skater in which he competed for twelve years. Um, Luis represented Mexico in countries such as Germany, Italy, Croatia, Slovakia, and has competed in events such as the World Championships, the Four Continents Championships, the U.S. Championships, and all the while, this is where it gets good, um, from the years of 2005 to 2014, Luis medaled nine consecutive years at the Mexican Championships, making him a six-time Mexican national champion, four of which were consecutive golds from the years of 2010 to 2014. Um, many more after that in terms of what he's doing now, but you can see why I wanted to write that down. Clearly, Luis has a lot of precious metals, um, either in a safe or buried at a, in an indisclosed location somewhere. So, uh, <laughs> how's that for an intro, Luis? Oh my God. Honestly, I didn't even, that was really good. I didn't even know those details. I don't even know where you got those. That was awesome. Hey man, I'm, I'm a recruiter by trade. I, I, my job is to research things on the internet at that all was times. Wild. I've never <laughs> heard anyone, and I've had introductions. I've never heard anyone get it like that. That was, oh. <laughs> yeah, awesome. man. I, and and here's another tidbit for everyone. Um, once again, speaking of talent, uh, with those accolades, specifically the Mexican championships. I don't if if you don't know if you weren't aware of the things that I just mentioned maybe you're not aware of this either um essentially logically speaking objectively speaking Luis you are the goat of Mexican figure skater you're the greatest Mexican figure skater of all time and that's no that's no fucking joke Yeah the yeah on paper um now we <laughs> We, we, after me came, there's a very talented young skater that is also making great headway. And he, he actually just competed at the Olympics and he's, okay. he's doing an amazing job of carrying the torch forward. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, he, he's got yeah. some catching up to do. He's got to get those rings. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like the, the Michael Jordan LeBron debate. I mean, <laughs> you, you got to get the, you got to get the precious metals first. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, no, yeah. I mean, no argument. <laughs> You're right? No, no. I'm, I'm. We got to be politically correct here. We don't want to ruffle feathers. I'm sure he's doing a great job. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, to kind of get started with, you know, figure skating, athletics. I mean, a lot of people uh, uh, that know me also know that I come from a athletic background. We both competed professionally. Um, uh, wanted to ask you, yeah, give me the, give me the rundown. How did that start? You know, why figure skating? You know, was there any influences? I'll stop with those questions for now. For sure. Um, actually, so I was born in Guadalajara, Jalisco. That's a town in Mexico. That's a large city. Um, and my sister was actually skating, um, at a rink there. She, she would be, you know, training every day. And I was basically a newborn and my parents would just bring me along to watch her practices and kind of, um, I mean, I just had to go. Where were they going to leave this kid, right? So I would be at all her practices every day. And I just kind of grew up watching the sport. Um, and by the time I was around two and a half years old, I, I really expressed an interest just by like, I want to get out there. Like I wanted to skate. And I was always like peeking on the walls by three years old. 
I was really starting to like beg mom and dad to let me skate. And they were kind of like, no, like that's not for for boys. Like we're not gonna, we're not gonna like what for? Just, you know, you just just watch your sister, watch your sister and enjoy that. But I was I, I recall even like at three and a half, three years old, I could I can still remember watching um the skaters that really impressed me. And I was just like, I was hypnotized. Um and I would I would start to create my own routines and programs and and just kind of start skating around on the carpet at home and try to like kind of simulate what they were doing. And I that's really where it started. I, I wanted to do what they were doing. And I think mostly they looked so free and happy. And I think as a kid, that's very attractive. And I I wanted to do that. And also just it was an instant, instant um attraction to the sport. Um with that said, my parents uh, just were very hesitant. My dad was like, oh, you could be a motorbiker. Or you could do some other sport that's more, you know, for boys. So it was never really like, they just kind of looked at me and were like, okay, you do your thing. And I would just skate on the carpet at home and whatever. That continued until we um, came to the United States. When I was five years old, my family um, came to the United States for my dad's work and also just to create a better life um, for, for the family. And I still, I don't know why, but I would still, my sister didn't skate anymore, but I still would skate in the carpet at home. I would pretend I was a skater. <laughs> I would put rollerblades on and skate around the driveway. And it was on. implanted. It was, it was already done. The DNA yeah, I was. Put on shows. <laughs> Everyone thought I was crazy, but I, I just, I loved it. And it never, um, it was something I never forgot. And so on my eighth birthday, I finally, the opportunity presented itself. We were at a shopping mall here in San Diego, California, actually. Um, and I, there was an ice skating rink at the mall. And so I kind of begged my family, like, can we go skate for my birthday? And they, they said, okay, yeah, sure. Let's go skate for your birthday. And I recall really clearly, I skated a session that was from 1 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. that day. And I never got off. I never got off the ice that day. Wow. Did you and have to I, pay for that? I'm, yeah, my parents were happy. My mom was like, oh, thank God, just somewhere we can leave this kid. Like, we can go do our thing. And <laughs> just left me there all day. And um, basically, I never got off the ice. And when they came back, I just, they couldn't deny that I loved the this, this sport, that I wanted to do it. And so I begged for lessons. And they said, all right, we'll take you for weekly lessons. It, was, it started off as, like, you know, recreational. Mm -hmm. I would go and do group lessons every Saturday. And from there, it just kind of started growing because I was progressing super fast. Um, so, you know, like I was two months in and I was already like acquiring skills that kids that were skating for years couldn't acquire. Mm -hmm. And so a coach was like, okay, well, you know, the coach of the group classes was like, you know, he might need some privates. He really has talent. He has potential. And she was a very honest lady too. It was someone that was very, like, you could trust her, you know, with her words. You just know those people that you can trust. And my parents are like, okay, well, okay, fine. They were hesitant, but they're like, all right, well, he's in, he's in love with it. He's happy. Uh, it's a great place for to drop the kid off. <laughs> so why not? Um, let's do it. And so I started taking privates, and then I just very quickly advanced through the ranks um, until I was around 13 and a half, and that's when I reached a pretty good level where I was um, starting to be pretty competitive on a national level, and that was when I qualified 13. to my, yeah, 13. And that's um, when I started to qualify for like the actual uh, competitions where you can qualify yourself to compete internationally, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so I qualified for to my first U.S. nationals, which means uh, only the 12, the top 12 skaters in the nation qualified to that, to that um, championship. And so that was a big deal. I qualified for my first U.S. nationals. And At that's 13. When yeah, that time I was 14, I believe, by that time. So did I have my math wrong? Uh, what did I say? 2005 to 2014, you were really at it. You had to have been, it had to have been, what, 90? I don't want to put, I don't want to give your oh, business and your age now. <laughs> but it had to have been like late 90s or? Um, no, it was in the early 2000s. Um, okay. And then late, yeah, it was. It's interesting because I started competing first representing the United States. Okay. And then I had a switch to represent back to my home country of Mexico. So okay. it was, yeah, I have a whole story and history and it's very, it's, it's very colorful. Um, but 
at first I was representing the US and I, I competed at my first US nationals around 14, 15. Mm -hmm. And then um, that's when I, I actually had the opportunity to work with the top coach in the world at the time who was in Los Angeles. Frank and something? Frank Carroll, yeah, Frank Carroll. And that's when he he took me on as his student. And I was um, really lucky. I was training alongside all the top skaters in the world at the time, Michelle Kwan. And mm -hmm. it was just a great atmosphere to where you really, I don't know, it felt very special for me at that time. And with that said, I, I, I continued training, competing. And um, for me, my training and my environment was not really the most... Uh, conducive to my well-being i just i had uh maybe how can i say it um it was really about like go 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 train 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 and not really paying attention to to my emotions to what i was feeling to how my body was feeling was it too much was it too little and so by the time i was around 18 um i had suffered like tremendous injuries um to my hips and they were really okay yeah. hold on a second i'm sorry to you, you all right because yeah. I already had, I, there was there was a plethora of questions I had coming into this that Please. you're touching on a lot of these things that, you know, and I'm sorry if that was rude. Sorry, people. No, um, it's not rude at all. The, the, the thing is, um, seeing as I, like, this this conversation is a, as much a learning experience for me as anyone who doesn't know much about figure skating, you know, and I kind of, let, let me just rewind it real, real quick, because there was something that you mentioned, you know, before you started. Uh, figure skating right um and before since you didn't have access to ice you had access to a living room and carpet <laughs> uh, um and i was watching something last night of a japanese figure skater who won the consecutive uh olympic golds i think it was do you know who i'm talking i can't i forgot his name you see uh, yeah. there you go <laughs> um and i saw him doing like vis visualization practices in front of a mirror doing you know basically skating anytime he can even off the ice and i wasn't sure if that was like all right is that an exceptional practice or is that standard uh is that something that you were doing at absolutely. all times okay. oh absolutely um i used to when i was in my teens i used to sleep um in my air position hoping that like my brain would <laughs> just register like the perfect air position yeah that's awesome that yeah yeah. I used to sleep with a basketball sometimes. I just yeah. felt safe. I felt at home. I was like, this is my baby. You know, <laughs> um, that's that is so cool. Now, and I and I wanted to add, so you mentioned when you first started, you were kind of surpassing some of the kids that had been doing this for years. And I'm I'm wondering, since you, you know, to start off at a very young age, you didn't have that access to ice, but you were always before that visualizing things that you weren't even just from what you saw you were practicing and i'm sure after lessons you took that home and continued um do you think that's where it is did your sorry did your progress do you think came from things like that or is there a typical i guess for, uh, type of individual that ends up being good at at figure skating like for okay, basketball that's, that's tall a, long arms that's a great athletic. question yeah that's a great question and um there are different factors of course um but with that said like there are factors like body type you know height the, the shorter you are the more compact um and and i mean if you have long lines and you're short and compact which is pretty much me <laughs> that's really like that's really lucky for skating right so that was already a great factor but there have been great champions that are six foot one, Brian Boitano, um, Evan Lysacek, that are, they're, they're super tall. Like mm -hmm. anyone would be like, oh, you would never make it in skating. But it's that, it is the visualization, the visualizing. I visualized too. So I had the whole thing going for me. I, I would visualize, it was constant, right? Like constantly mm -hmm. imagining, like, how would that feel? Like, how would that look? That, yeah, that's a huge part. And I know that any athlete in skating at the top does this has all, all we all have done that same same thing so yeah right. it's absolutely a must and and and, and that's why it, it kind of eventually we're going to segue into what where i so rudely cut you off at because that just to kind of give my experiences as a professional um well one i don't really have much experience in individual sports i've, I've mostly only played team sports but even with that 
I think I said to you in an earlier conversation, like waking up at 5 a.m., put doing your heart, your toughest workout of the day to get it out of the way. Um, every little thing you do, every step you take, every drink, you know, Gatorade or, or, or meal you have, you're just constantly thinking about, is this going to get me closer to my goal or is someone getting better than me right now? It's almost obsessive in, in a way. Um, it, with the visualization, though, um, the one individual sport I did do, and I wish I really, I wish I took note of this and applied this in the years after, I did track and field. Not running. I wasn't very fast, but I was explosive and I can jump. I did long jump and triple jump. Uh, my first meet, I was an unknown. You know, I played baseball my first year, then I quit and I did track. I was an unknown guy in the conference and within our league. There were the top dogs and then there was just me. Um, I got, I tied for, no, I got second place in my first meet. And I remember leading up to it, just laying before my my meet uh, my event, just laying on the track in a you know in the corner somewhere. Um, I remember the night before I recorded the visualizations of my steps, and I I sounded it out: step, 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 hop, skip, jump, and and I listened to it the whole day, and I killed it that day. Wow. Yeah. It was definitely the visualizations. And I, I, I stopped doing that after that. I was like, Oh, I, I got this now. My track and field career didn't really pan out. <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely think it makes a huge difference. I digress, but. Absolutely. There have been times when I leading up to an event, I might have been injured or I couldn't even skate and just, I would visualize instead of practice. And I was able to, at that moment, bring it out when it counted um, through visualization. That's really all I can blame it on. <laughs> right. Yeah. Crazy. Well, now Crazy. blaming, that's, that's yeah. attributing. Blame it on, <laughs> blame it on that. <laughs> um, so, okay, let's kind of get into then, because as we're kind of going into the mindset now of an athlete overall, generally, um, with any successes, gold medals, championships, things like that, um, definitely comes the 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 um, the factor of mental stability or or the right right practices for your mental health and keep you stable while dedicating so much. So let's resume that part. You you started to mention. Tell me what that looked like. Yeah, that that's the way you put it. Is actually perfect. Um... I started to, like I said, I qualified for my first U.S. championships. Um, you know, now not only are the people in your team starting to, you know, not ex I would, I, I guess I could say I expect certain results and certain um, work to be put into your career because they're also putting it in, right? Like your team is mm -hmm. also putting that work in. So um, not only they are, but also like you start to take note like, oh, I'm skating in the stadium and all of these people are they're here and they know who I am and they're, they're watching mm. me and you start to get your psyche just kind of changes. Um, and I don't know if it's always positive, um, especially when for myself, I didn't have that kind of support where I could talk to someone like, Hey, mm. uh, I'm feeling this sort of way. I'm feeling over, over trained over. I didn't really have that. And it wasn't really, uh, part of my culture at the time of skating culture it wasn't really something that was it was almost frowned down upon sometimes like oh you what you need a psychologist kind of thing mm. and it was just a, a different time right still now, is I, kind of it, it still is but i think it's getting thankfully there's more awareness coming to it but mm. at the time it was like why do you like do you need a psychologist are you i mean are you you're just a mess you're crazy like and it was like okay i'm just gonna be quiet and being quiet was what inside i was not okay i was starting to feel a lot of pressure i was starting to be pressured um and from different angles from your family like without even them knowing right like they they just want the best for you and they know that they only know like oh well we just push you know like how else mm. do we support we push um and so that started to eat up at me and not only at me but it was also showing in my body because I wasn't getting the proper recovery. I wasn't getting the proper rest. And so 
my body was just overtaxed. And that's when the injuries started to develop. And slowly but surely, one day I just, I couldn't walk. I couldn't even get up to, wow. to go get a drink of water. And the, the, what's interesting about that is that like that culture of staying quiet, of, of playing tough, of being hard, of like, oh, I'm going to power through anything is what led me there. Maybe had I spoken earlier, had I expressed what I was feeling or going through, maybe it would have been different, but there's no really going back. And it was a big lesson for me too. Um, mm -hmm. of, of assertion, of, 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 uh, expressing, uh, expressing my, what I'm feeling, what I'm going through. And, um, yeah, it's, it definitely led to those injuries. And unfortunately, like I said, at the time, it wasn't part of the culture to think of a, an athlete's mental health or their mm -hmm. well-being. And so I, I had to take a very long pause. I thought my career was over at that moment, around 18, 19, and I needed answers um, from doctors. I needed to know what was going to happen. And most of them said like, well, you're never going to be the same. That's, and if you get surgery, that type of surgery I needed at the time was just like being started. developed. Yeah, yeah, just started. So they were like, we don't, we can't tell you, you might never, you may never be able to skate again. And I was like, whoa, that's not an option. And with that, though, came a, a huge depression, right? A huge loss of identity because I had to be off of the ice. I was depressed. I had suicidal tendencies. I was eating disordered. I had all, the whole gamut of, you know, mental mm -hmm. health issues at that point in my life. Um, and so I was really lucky. I, I came, I was training out of Los Angeles. I came back home to San Diego because I wasn't going to be skating and my family was all here. And so I, I came back and I kind of started searching for answers. Um, how, how can I get better? How can I continue mm -hmm. to do what I love? Is there a way? And so that's when I met um, Pamela, is her name, Pamela Minix, who actually is now working with me in a project that I'm working on that we'll talk about later, I'm sure. Um, but she, she was working out of a rehabilitation center for athletes here in San Diego. And I saw her, I met her, and she said, okay, I can't guarantee you that you'll be back a hundred percent, but I, I can see and know that if we change some, some things and some habits and some ways that we could get you back out there and, and competing. And so slowly she introduced me to a whole new way of, of being, of training, of, um, just a, a, a healthy way for me, for mm -hmm. my mind, for my body, for everything. It wasn't just, she didn't never just focused on recovering my, my physical body. She also focused on, helping me to recover um, ways of thinking, ways of approaching the sport, ways of approaching practice. And that changed my life, really. It, it helped me to, to have those tools and to be able to, to go back to skating. And then after that is when I won those national titles, represented my country, got to compete internationally on the world level, et cetera. That's correct. Okay, so you, right there, you hit another. So in my research of figure skating, a lot of things that was coming up was the mental part of it, mental preparation, um, you know, handling anxiety and stress, either post uh, uh, competition or pre. And I was going to ask you, did you have was this something that you engaged in? Did you have like, a, I guess, a mental coach or something like that? It sounds like in a way, she was. Um, but that uh, just to reiterate that holistic type of healing, uh, I can resonate with that. I mean, I don't think people really understand the the wear and tear of an athlete. Um, it, it when someone gets hurt, it doesn't. It isn't always just you broke your leg. You know, someone slammed into you, you fell and you broke your wrist or something like that. It could just be the everyday process of it and the the pounding of the ligaments and joints. Um, that's something that i guess i experienced too when uh my first real injury i had a herniated disc i was on the couch for like three weeks straight couldn't play for four months um same thing depression identity i was like what do i do now i think at that time because i was so used to needing to um commit to something dedicate to something see progress in some type of way i guess physically i grew dreads like <laughs> I, I don't know if you've seen them. I, ha I used to have dreads down to my shoulders until I lost all my hair. But, you know, that was kind of one way I did it. But then in the physical therapy aspect, I I, I was taught that, yes, I, I 
worked so hard in the weight room and being fast, being strong, that I only worked on very particular muscle groups or whatever, and I neglected a bunch of other ones. That's where these, I guess, chronic pains and stuff came up. So even though I didn't get a mental coach then, except for my dreads growing process, I was shown the holistic healing that is, we got to fix what is broken, but we also need to build what is not supporting those, those parts of your body. So, and for me after that, that's where a whole new level of strength, control, balance, and speed came about that I had no idea. I was like, man, I just unlock the code here <laughs> yeah that's so it for me it was exactly the same i was you know you use the same muscles for skating the over and over and over and you're totally neglecting other parts of your body and mm. pam was a she worked in bi with biomechanics she was a specialist in biomechanics so she learned how to really um basically balance all those imbalances out she she helped me to do that and yeah it was a for me too it was a whole new way of training understanding my body and going through the skating process itself nice nice and then so uh, since you connected with her that's where that's where the the gold and riches came uh well i don't i'm not gonna i don't know about riches i'm speaking <laughs> metaphorically but um what was the difference let's say going into a competition and and i guess the mindset or any nerves anxiety and stuff before when you were a teenager right and then once you've kind of taken you took more i guess uh focus on the mental aspects there it it was a complete 180 um from a teenager basing his worth basing his his meaning in life on just an event or a medal or a result mm -hmm. to a person that was not anymore you know a person to a person now as a person i was a person that skated that competed mm -hmm. and that was the difference i was no longer basing my worth on a result i was no longer basing my my meaning as a as an individual on this earth on on a competition so that was what and it freed me it was so freeing and i i was able to compete better compete stronger um than and the, in the, as a teenager, I was a wreck. I would be a wreck going into an event. It was right. literally, it meant survival in my head, in my brain, you know, like it meant mm -hmm. like the brain is very tricky. Like if it, it if it's that it's worth and meaning is based on a result, you're mm -hmm. going to be scared for your life going out there. Right. right. <laughs> I think uh, I, I agree. I think when I was younger, going into like a big game or a game that meant something from a result standpoint, or outcome standpoint, more often than not, I think my, my, I let my mind get the best of me. Um, I think going into my more professional years, it, it might have been a, a, a mixture of, hey, this, this, this isn't granted anymore. I, I can't take this for granted. If I don't perform, I get cut, I get sent home. And, I, and that's the end of my, my passion for basketball, right? Um, I learned to go into like really big games, high stakes games, just, I don't want to say not giving a fuck. I don't, not, not, not <laughs> giving a fuck, but kind of like, fuck it. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. the only two things are certain after the outcome of this game, win or lose. Yeah. So let's play the damn game. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know? and I, would just... get, I know exactly what you're talking about. I would get there. I would get to that point. That's because that's the only way, right? Like, I would have to just be like, okay, this is going to be over. Like, what are you going to do? Let's go. And that, then it would just like, okay, I'm free. Let's it, go. it puts you back in the moment, in the present rather than yeah. worrying about, you know, it just keeps you the Zen mindset, I guess. But yeah, um, you're, yeah, I still hear you. So, so hear. before, so, okay successes, gold medals and all that. Did you have, um, was there one, any one, I guess, competition or placing or medal that you're most, I guess, that meant more to you that, that, that you're most proud of anything like that? 
Actually, it was a competition where I did not get a medal. I actually ended up pretty low in the rankings. Um, it was at the 2009 World Championships. Um, okay. And it's special to me because I think that's when I I really touched on like the power that is, is within me, within everyone. I'll tell you why. Um, the night before the the opening of the competition, I the that whole day of practice, I wasn't able to walk. Like I couldn't walk. I was mm. so injured and so broken that I couldn't I couldn't walk. And I was like, okay, uh, wow, I can't walk. How am I going to go out there and do a program with triple jumps and land on one leg? <laughs> Uh, I did. So I was like, okay. So I, I literally sat down. I remember in my, in my room, in my hotel room, um, it was in Los Angeles, that world championships. And it was at the Staples center in Los Angeles. And I remember just sitting in my hotel room and just visualizing and feeling mm -hmm. like how it feels and, and standing, I stood in front of a mirror for, I think three hours. <laughs> and well, I kind of stood, I was holding myself up and I was like visualizing what I would do. And and, you know, like for me, withdrawing from that from that um, world championships was not an option. It was in my basically my hometown. I mean, I had mm -hmm. all my friends, my family there. It was the first time that I think in a long time that a world was hosted there. And so I did that. I woke up. I was mm, not feeling so good, but I could kind of limp around. And then somehow I brought it out of myself to go out there and I skated for at the moment, like one of the best programs that I could have ever done. And that was incredible, like to feel that power and to feel that, um, it sounds yeah, I, get, like, I get chills, like look, yeah, thinking about it. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad, oh, I'm glad yeah. this is perfect because in some, I, at some point in this conversation, I, I had to ask you about the zone. Uh, and I want to talk to you about it. It sounds like in this situation, because I mean, your body wasn't exactly there, but you feel like you tapped into something. It sounds, were, were you in the zone there? Yeah, I would say for most of that, uh, competition, I was in the zone. Yeah. Okay. That's the only way. That's the only way. But I was so like, uh, yeah, it was crazy. So, so for, for the people listening that never experienced that they've only heard about it, watched movies. Um, I feel like there's no, there's really, there really is no way to describe it. You can only feel it, but, and I'll share my, my experience, the one that sticks in my head, but I, I want, I, I wish people could really understand this. Like what, what did, what's your explanation? Oh, can't, I can't even get the word to ask. Um, recount that for me. Uh, when you, that phenomenon, I guess, of being in the zone, that sheer focus. Oh, uh, I get, yeah, I get, because <laughs> it's, go. <laughs> it's complete, it really is complete, the loss, like, the total loss of fear is the first thing I can say, like, there's just, there's nothing, there's nothing, it's almost like there's nothing there, Hell yes. <laughs> and, and then it's automatic, it happens automatically literally it's effortless it's completely effortless it was effortless it was effortless because i guess you're so present that you don't even have it was it's crazy too i would get off the i got off the ice and you can't really remember what just happened i'm getting chills because you're, yeah. you're 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 explaining exactly what i have in my okay i'm glad you mentioned like it's it's the nothingness right mm -hmm. because i i know i mentioned focus right sheer focus but even that, I'd say to, to say you have focus means that you're consciously present in some type of way. Right. Um, going into the zone, and in my experience, the one that I'm thinking of, the, Mark the Deacon <laughs> ceased to exist for that span of two hours in a way. Uh, I blacked out, right? You know, it, it, was, it, it was our championship game. It was the only championship I ever won. Um, and I, I wouldn't say on the stat sheet that I just had a phenomenal score. I was a scorer. I shot the ball. I put the ball in the hole. I didn't pass very well. I wasn't like the most tenacious defender. But from what I can remember, that was like the most complete game I ever had. Every, any time, like just made the right plays at all times, right? Um, 
I don't remember any specific shots or plays really, but I do remember after we won, we shook hands and everything with the other team. I remember everyone jumping around. I went straight to the locker room and I sat there by myself kind of like I, I was starting to regain consciousness and come back. Um, started hyperventilating a little bit. I remember my young, uh, my young, our young teammate, he was uh, like 17 on the pro team. He comes in, Mark, come on, man. This is in France. Come on, man. We, we fucking win, bro. Like, come on, get up, man. And I'm just like, yo, 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 give me a second here. Cause I, 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 I was like, I, it, honestly, it was the best panic attack I've ever had. <laughs> <The best one. laughs> and uh, afterwards, of course, I mean, once I came back, yeah, I got pretty buck wild for sure. But <laughs> before <Of course>. that, <laughs> this focus, it was just, I don't know. Sometimes I take myself back there and I get the chills, but I'm, I'm, thank you for answering hey, that. I hope hey, the people out there heard that. No, thank you never... for taking me back there. It's, yeah. I don't really revisit it all the time. And like, and it's happened in, in other, in other instances, but that, that one to me was really powerful, like not able to move. And somehow I was able to get out there and bring right. something out of myself. Right. And I, and I think the, the, one a point here is that anyone that I mean you don't have to be an athlete to experience this you just got to kind of how this conversation started you know a couple of days ago you got you really got to tap into who you are and find what that thing is and stop being a robot right <laughs> and 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 get into it and really let yourself go there um anyone can experience it i encourage anyone to strive for that it's it's an amazing feeling now Speaking of, you know, I, I guess uh, uh, who we are and what we're doing. So after, for most athletes, there's always an identity crisis. You know, what do I do next? Things like that. Uh, I believe after you finished uh, uh, competing, you started coaching. Um, and with that, um, I'll let you, you know, I don't want to dig on too many questions, but the, your experience with coaching in turn kind of is what started your company uh yeah, lasso yeah. safe so yeah right. tell me That's about that um well now you know about you know my past my experiences the injuries the me realizing that uh i my environment didn't support me the way i needed it not because it's anyone's fault it's just literally the culture that i lived in right and so i went into to teaching right away after retirement and I started to see and notice that the athletes that I was teaching other athletes um, were still living the same culture that I lived the one that really didn't support them fully the way like an athlete needs to be supported and so that really um, at first it was shocking I was like oh I thought things maybe had progressed I thought things maybe had you know gotten better for for athletes and and then I started to explore also like, why, why isn't it changing? Like what, why are we choosing to stay, you know, stagnant the same when there are ways that we could progress? And that's when th those questions all led me to, to, I, I wanted a solution. And it, it was coming from a place of, of um, really loving my sport and actually loving the people in it and my community. It, I really, I have nothing but gratitude for everyone in, involved. But it was like, we could be better. Like, why, why, I know, like, through my experience and my, and I was blessed to be able to, to heal and to, to have a different outcome. But I saw a lot of my friends, you know, they ended up having major problems and issues in their adulthood from their experience in sport when it should mm -hmm. be the reverse, right? Sport should build you up, make you, help you to thrive in life. And I, I was seeing the opposite. I was seeing friends that were now broken that experienced horrible things that have, really hurt their lives um and so I, I i sat down with pam who i talked about earlier and i told her what was going on and she and i had been having these conversations for over a decade of, about how we could bring change or how we could bring a better culture to sport and that's when we we really you know we sat down and we thought about like okay, we need to create a solution and we need to, we need other people that have the same mentality that we do 
And so we started to reach out to athletes, um, business people, uh, just anyone that we thought could support our vision of making a safer, better culture. And we kind of sat down and it's and it was a, a discussion and brainstorming, like, how can we do this? And we thought of different ways. First, we were like, oh, we, maybe we can make a facility that is that is the flagship and the, the example of what uh, athlete well-being looks like. And then we thought, well, that really is not going to create the impact that we want. Like, we want to be able to impact all of sport, not just, you know, one or two sports here or there. And so that's when we we started more conversations and we got a lot of uh, feedback from business professionals and they were like, well, why don't you guys create some type of certification for for sports centers? And that could, you know, that could just be for, that could cover all and, and all sports. Mm -hmm. And then we started to see how we could do that. So we started to realize, okay, well, we're going to need research. We're going to need re to research the centers that, that already have, um, you know, a reputation of being safe for the athletes. And that's when the research started. Um, and also that's when we just started developing the whole thing. And that's what became also safe, you know, a certification for sports centers, for sports communities mm -hmm. um, on how on implementing athlete safety and well-being. But with that said, we knew that it had to have a component um, of profitability. Like it had to, bring profits to the center mm -hmm. that's a big fear you know of of in sport that, that's been a big fear and i think why a big reason why we we've, we've stayed smaller um is because there's that fear that being open about these topics and n might lead to to losses in in mm -hmm. in that in that way and i think the big thing is that there's never been um a clear way of expressing right these topics that is how do i say it? that is uh I'm, i i know the word um i don't want to say credible i guess it's credibility or or uh, shows i guess sound data sound results or something like that i i uh, I, I, yeah. I the right word is in my head i just you got it and so we, in there. we have we have data to back up you know, like what we're doing. And so yeah. that's the first time that that's been done. And I and, think that's really what's making the difference. And, 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 you know, that's, um, I think that's an, that's an interesting thing. Uh, uh well, one, it sounds like you're kind of starting small so that you can create, uh, a, I guess a, a data set, a data set that shows that it's a successful program in process so that, you know, rather than trying to push it on, uh, uh everyone, people can see the results and say, Hey, we need this. But one thing that, uh, you know, once again, in my research is kind of looking at, you know, the website Lasso safe, I'll link it. Don't worry. Um, is it, you know, these days, I think everyone generally means well, everyone has ideas that they want to help and everything like that, or make changes. Usually that comes from a place of vagueness, gray area and kind of lofty, uh, ideals, right? Um, one thing that I, that, you know, from my, I'm kind of going on a tangent now, bear with me. Um, my uh, psychology background from university, um, people, you know, aside from just the people say psychology, they think therapist or, you know, uh, psychiatry or whatever. I was more on the empirical side of things, the, the studies, the research, um, uh, guidelines, surveys, you know, how do you gather the right data to be able to make either social or psychological changes or improvements. And I didn't, I wasn't, you know, I didn't know how I understood what Lasso Safe was. I didn't understand how you're doing it, but I was impressed to see that you're doing it by way of let's build, let's, let's really build a type of guideline, a baseline, I think is what is, baseline, you guys yeah. called it in, in terms of how i guess best practices within the athletics world or or i don't know if this i don't yeah. know if you've implemented this or or yeah. wish to implement it for high schools colleges or all around parks i, I don't know um, yeah we've worked with schools and um esports and just centers individually that's exactly what we're doing we're also just working with whole communities now we want whole cities to be able to adopt the lasso safe certification so okay. yeah so and 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 currently and it it's 
from what you told me, it's 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 moving. It's starting to to you know yeah. uh, uh, get some air up under it. Um, I think you mentioned like you are engaged with government uh, representatives, and so it's not just like to me. Once you once you get the attention of the government, that's like you know you're doing something. So you know how does how's it looking now? I guess and where do you see it going? And what's the vision? What's the goal? And well, I think the what you said is so spot on. The the first things first is that we are just trying to establish a baseline. We're not trying to to you know change the world in one day. We know that's not going to happen. We're introducing. We have a pilot program, which is what we're really um, getting out there right now, and it's basically an app where a city, a school, or a sports community can adopt, put it on their website. A kid, it would give a kid or an athlete. Um, the ability to go in there and report any instance of abuse through an app button, basically. Mm -hmm. um, it's all AI. So basically, depending on what those the, the questioner that the kid answers, uh, depending on those answers, it either goes to a higher authority or it stays internal within the community. And it can mm -hmm. be dealt with. It can be rectified. Um, and so basically, it's a very simple plan right now. It's a very simple process. Um, that's going to lead us to being able to implement really much more complex best practices, like you said. Mm -hmm. Like and maybe so courses and stuff like that? Exactly, course, courses. And there we have a whole already certification built that it requires a lot more like detailed work, like a center's even where, say we're a director's office's place, like architect, the architecture of the center to make it safer for the mm. athlete. So there's, it gets more and more complex, but right now we're just trying to establish a base point of safety where, right. you know, that already will, is a huge uh, statement for a community to, to say, we adopted this certification. You are, you are being heard. You're being seen. That's already a change of mind. Like, mm -hmm. right. You're stepping into a place where like, Oh, I feel safe here. I know like there, someone cares. And mm -hmm. so that's where we're starting. Um, the vision is obviously to be across the United States, be every right. in every sport community that we can be in, um, and that's really where where we're where we're at, where our minds at. Um, and, and is it? Just, I'm taking a stab here. Would I don't? And maybe this is already done, or it's happened already. Um, one of the goals maybe is it to have get it to a point where. It's almost like a, 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 the certification is like accredited in a way in which maybe there might be some requirements for someone trying to uh, start a sports program or something that's like you have to adhere to these guidelines and these best practices backed by the state or federally or things like that's that. Exactly or has where, that, yeah. Yes, that's exactly where, where we're heading and where we want to, to be. Um, okay. I think every, yeah, everyone deserves that. That's yeah. the least we deserve as a community have you uh have you gotten anyone on board yet not not government speaking but like any teams programs yeah park districts, I, we how's have, that? yeah we have right now we actually have um one very large facility in alabama it's called sound mountain park um an amphitheater and they're they're really committed to athlete safety and we just love to have that relationship um is really special to us they they really have set the president for for sports facilities so that's mm -hmm. really something big um and we, we're just feeling really blessed to to be able to have that nice no that's that's awesome and, and I, I i guess i'll segue this into the, uh, the reason why i mean not just your figure skating background is i mean yeah that's talent of course but you know the 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 entrepreneur entrepreneur mindset and the the I guess running a business and starting something that's your vision um uh, that's more i guess more tied to your true identity like the the identity of luis the mayan king not luis <laughs> necessarily the figure skater um i want to bring up the dream team uh and you know how maybe that and I'll, we'll explain what the dream team is here but how that um uh, where where you feel that fit in, why you feel like you needed it or, or why you wanted to engage with it and, and, and where in the process of your, the growth of your business was dream team present. Um, 
for the people, let's explain. How would you explain? So we, we work with, uh, would you call Gilad a, a life coach or career coach? Like, I, I don't think he <laughs> even wants to have a title. You yeah, know? he doesn't like the labels. So <laughs> I think Gilad is someone that uh, really facilitates um, people seeing themselves fully and mm -hmm. clearly yeah that's the best way i can explain it okay I, I would agree and and just to give more context to everyone um so luis and i we met um in this group right we call the dream team essentially um gilad is like a you know kind of we'll just say career coach or life coach um in which he he was a professional athlete as well played basketball in israel over 10 years and I think he specializes in those that are former athletes, business owners, leaders, entrepreneurs. Um, it's a really great group. This is kind of where we met. And, you know, I kind of joined that group and without even trying to force anything, I don't know, here, here I am wearing a t-shirt called t with talent XM on it, talking to a six time gold medalist. And I think it kind of, that was kind of a catalyst for me to just really tap into I don't even, I can't even put the words in it, tap into me and, and, and really share, you know, create, provide a service, things like that. So what about you? Like when, when, when did you join the team? Cause I came, I'm, I'm a rookie. You're, you're a seasoned vet at this point. Yeah, it's been, well, it's been well over a year that I've been part of the team and you said it. Uh, I think this is really spot on. I, for me, I, in this whole journey as a now having a business, et cetera, I felt really lonely. Um, it was lo a lonely road. It was a road where uh, everyone around me was like, what are you doing? Like, mm -hmm. why, what, like what? Now you're doing, but you are a skater. Like you are going to be a coach. You're going to be in skating. That's all you, like, that's you. And I, it, that was everyone that surrounded me, right? And it was very few people that supported this vision that I had of of something uh, bigger, not for just me, but for for the world and the communities that I that I care about. Um, and so, you know, I, that's when I somehow Gilad and I crossed paths, and he started to to chat with me about you know Blasso and what I'm what I was doing, and then also what he was doing, and it was very like-minded he was mm -hmm. forging a new path and i was as well and it was one that's for myself and nobody's really done in sport what i'm trying to do <laughs> so uh it was it got lonely and it got um yeah it got it got i got i could feel lonely sometimes and it was like oh there's other people out there that are taking that same path that i'm taking huh how cool i i want to be a part of that i want to be in that group i want to yeah let's do it and then also that we're all past athletes i think that just like i was like okay i'm in and right. <laughs> it's been a great and it has been a great place it's been and it only gets better the more that we we get to know each other it's like whoa now i really get like why i was drawn to to being a part of this right no and, and uh um the, I, I man i just lost my train of thought because i there's so many things you know, know spinning up here but um yeah, I think uh, uh, Gilad, same way, you know, he reached out to me and uh, it was more the the advocacy for former athletes that kind of caught my attention because um, my whole family, all athletes, a lot of a lot of my connections, my friends, athletes, you know, you mentioned just the the struggles that some go through afterwards. And I remember thinking, man, there's got to be something. There's got to be something a better way to help athletes transition. Uh, at the time when I was still finishing my degree um, after playing professionally, I was thinking maybe I can recruit for corporate positions specifically for athletes, mm -hmm. kind of help them transition. Maybe that's still in the future. I, I, I kind of, you know, that was a thought that I didn't ne never went back to, but when he reached out, I was like, yeah, let's have a call. I want to learn about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And it just made sense to kind of go with it. So no. And 
I remember the other thing. Sorry. Bear with me, people. I do this. Um, <laughs> ADHD. Um, support is one thing. Having the support of, your, of the people around you is one thing, and that's great. I think where, for me, Dream Team, what I get out of it besides, aside from support, is understanding. Like, it's like, no matter what anyone in that group is doing, it's almost like, I, I feel like I just understand you. I understand you all um, because we're here and, and we're doing things that are untraditional or, or creating our own paths, or at least that's what we're working towards. That Those are our goals. So um, I, I wanted to take some time to bring that up because Dream Team and, you know, that work is really synonymous with, I think the creation of what I'm trying to do right now with all of this. So, and thank you. I, I, I don't know. That was kind of all my questions, uh, honestly. Awesome. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, I'm more than happy and excited and thankful to you too. So Yeah. Um, I, I'm trying to think of, I'm, I'm kind of new to this, trying to think of a good way to sign off, but um, we talked about Lasso, but anything, what's a way that people, this sounds so corny. I've heard this on YouTube so many times. What's a way that people can, you know, I guess the best way to find out about, you know, you about Lasso Safe, the mission, um, is it, you know, just a link or is, do you have social media platforms, all that stuff so I can link it? I think the best start is to check out our website. I think it has a plethora of information. It really um, explains what we're doing. And I think that's the best, the best way to find and support us as mm -hmm. best as possible. Okay. Well, I'll I'll tell anyone that does take my words of advice and listen to them. I'll tell them to go to your website first, then after come to Talent XM. It's talentxm.co. Um, I'll link it. But yeah, anyone that wants to, hey, look, this is where you broadcast your gifts, right? Little tagline there. Come to the website if you're interested in chatting. Um, I'm waiting for y'all. But other than that, Luis, Mayan King, uh, I guess I'll see you, what, next week? Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, uh, but yeah, everybody, that was, I'm the Deacon. This is Luis, and we're out. Peace.